people going into this field now because it is it is really uh, expanding and becoming very interesting. A lot of people are becoming interested in it. Got interesting pictures there, Gordon. Coming yeah, that, uh, that fish is a uh, kelp greenling, uh, very common in this area, and that's a sunflower star that the diver is holding up. Uh, they can have up to 24 arms, be two or three feet across, and they're a voracious predator on all kinds of marine life, like crabs and uh, clams, swimming scallops and abalone. And uh, now we're going to go to Ontario to visit with Constantine. Hi, are you there? Yes, I am. Ed, what's your question? Why do gray whales migrate to different places for food, and what kind of food do they eat? Just a second. We're, we're, I'm going to come right back to you, because right now, Constantine, we have live on the picture a wolf eel. Remember the one that we looked at there? That's uh, live coming in from British Columbia right now, right under the water here at uh, Race Rocks. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to your question, Constantine, very shortly, but let's just get Gordon Green on the line to talk about this wolf eel for us. Hi, Roger. Yeah, he seems to it. be investigating the diver here. I don't know if he's looking for food. Oh, here comes a kelp greenling. So look at that. See how tame they are? It, although they look very ferocious, uh, they're, they're a very tame animal. He's probably uh, begging for food, as a matter of fact. Uh, since some of the wolf eels around here have been hand-fed previously by divers um, over the years, and whenever a diver comes down now, they probably associate it with the person with food and come out to uh, see if they can beg a morsel. Well, let's get Jim Darling to continue with that question for Constantine over in the Ontario Science Center. Yes, hi, hi Constantine. Uh, uh, the question about migration of gray whales, uh, primarily uh, the, the, it's, the migration seems to be uh, 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 powered by the necessity of the females to go south into warmer, protected waters to have their babies. Uh, once they've done that, then they head up to where food is more plentiful. Uh, in the you know temperate zones, in the Arctic zones, uh, such as we live in here, is uh, you know food is very seasonal, or the availability of food. And so what they do is feed in the summertime where there's lots of food. Uh, if they stayed through the winter, there wouldn't be much food anyway. Uh, so the females go down uh, to the lagoons where they have their babies. The males simply follow the females because it's also mating time. And uh, once that has occurred, uh, they all head north again. I hope that answers. Oh. Hi, who's um, there? It's Eric. Hi, Eric. What's your question? Okay, how do we? How do whales get beached? Go ahead. Beached, uh, as we're watching this uh, wolf eel on the screen here. Uh, uh, Interestingly, it's only two or three different species of, of, of whales which are responsible for uh, most of the uh, beachings. Uh, yeah, I'm let's afraid to, uh, we'll come back to this question here. Over to Gordon to talk about the wolf eel. Thanks, Jim. Uh, it seems he's just grabbed a, a green sea urchin here. You're going to see how powerful his jaws are. Sea urchins have a, a very strong shell around them and uh, all those spines. And the spines, as you see, don't seem to be bothering him at all. He's uh, got it in his mouth, and maybe uh, he's a bit shy about eating it right now, but it, pretty soon he'll be uh, crunching that up and eating the meat inside of it. There he goes. Not used to all these people watching him, I guess. Oh, look yeah, at him. He's, he's broken, broken the shell. Over. Those must be incredibly powerful jaws, Gordon. They are. They're very, very strong jaws. It's a good thing that they're so friendly because if one of those ever bit you, it would, uh, it yeah, well, would do a lot of damage. They have very large molar teeth in the back of their mouth that can just crush those shells to pieces in no time at all. Well, let's get back to Jim Darling as he finishes his question there. Back to the beaching question. We're getting upstaged here by Wolfield, but uh, usually it's the other way around. But uh, uh, as I was saying, there's only, you know, of, of, a, of lots of different species of whales, it's only two or three different types which are responsible for, for maybe 90% of the strandings. And those consist of pilot whales, false killer whales, which are large, uh, essentially large dolphins. Uh, uh, no one really knows sort of the answer to, to why did they beach themselves, but it appears that uh, uh, it's whales which are sick or ill or old, and they tend to travel into shallow water, so as uh, possibly, at least, so as they, they don't drown. And drowning is a problem whales have. And so uh, uh, they move into shallow waters and then get caught in the tides. And uh, there's also a social component here, where if, if one sort of sick animal moves in, uh, it, uh, the rest of the, the, the group will follow. And uh, 
as often as not, they get stranded and uh, all end up dying. It's one of those questions, though, which uh, uh, we really don't have all the answers for. And so we need more researchers, eh, Jim? Absolutely. We need more people to get involved in science and technology, and that's what the safari is all about. We want to encourage you to get involved in math and sciences at school so that you, too, later on, can venture into the world of exploration, whether it's going to be discovering a new cure for a disease or a new computer program. You can get involved and find out that science is probably one of the most exciting jobs and places to be. Well, let's use some of that science and technology now and travel... Actually, I think uh, an average estimate on them now is pretty close to 40 years. 